on. This is audio sync. Awesome. All right. Um, could you state your name and your position here? Sure. My name is Francis French, uh, F R A N C I S F R E N C H. I'm Director of Education here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. So if you want to put me as space flight historian, that's fine too, whatever works best for you. Um, so how did Doc Isley dodge the fate of Apollo 1? Would you be able to start us off and kind of um, what happened on Apollo 1? Sure. What happened to Don Isley? Absolutely. Don Isley was supposed to be on the Apollo 1 crew, the very first planned Apollo flight. He was assigned to that with two other astronauts. Um, unfortunately, he had an issue with, in a zero-G airplane where he actually dislocated his shoulder to the point where he was taken off that crew. Turns out to be incredibly lucky for him because that flight was supposed to make that first mission. A couple of weeks before it was supposed to launch, there was a tragic launch pad fire on the launch pad they were supposed to launch from. All three astronauts died inside the spacecraft, very much like the one behind me. So he felt sad that he was going to miss out on that first flight. As it was, it probably saved his life. So uh, what, what did the astronauts feel after the tragedy? How did they react to all of that? So by late 19, um, by early 1967, NASA was getting very close to the end of the decade. John F. Kennedy had said America must land on the moon before the end of the decade. And NASA had had a pretty good unbroken streak of success. The Mercury missions followed by the Gemini missions had put NASA way ahead of the Russians. A couple of years before the end of the decade, NASA were feeling very confident they were going to land on the moon within a year and a half or so. Right as they're about to launch the very first Apollo mission to get ready to go to the moon, there's a tragedy. Fortunately and, for and unfortunately, it was on the ground. When a tragedy happens on the ground, the investigators can get inside the spacecraft. They can work out what happened. If the tragedy had been in space, they may have never have known what happened. It was a huge blow for NASA with just a couple of years to get to the end of the decade and land on the moon. These days, I don't think they could have done it. The report would probably not even been written about the accident by, in two years' time. As it was, people were standing on the moon within two years, and it was an incredible turnaround. But at the time, it was a huge blow. NASA were very confident about their Apollo spacecraft, and before a crew had even launched, three people had died. The trouble was that the spacecraft was pressured with pure oxygen. Pure oxygen is a lot easier to use when you're in space because it's a lot simpler. The trouble is, when it's on the ground at high pressure, it's essentially a really good catalyst for a fire. So if you've got a tiny electrical spark, or if you've got materials that can catch fire easily, they will go up in flames very, very quickly. And that's what happened inside that Apollo 1 spacecraft. It was pressurized for sea level, which it never would have been in space. Probably they think an electrical spark was enough to ignite a fire inside, and the, the three guys inside died within seconds. So Don Isley should have been inside that spacecraft. If had it not been for a shoulder injury, he would have been, and he probably would have died that day. Did, uh, did he, I remember in your memoir he uh, mentioned some uh, distaste for what happened. Uh, can you go over what he said? Sure. My understanding is that Don Isley, along with the rest of the astronaut corps, were very, very upset by what happened with that fire because, in retrospect, it could have been prevented. The trouble with a very high-tech engineering thing such as spacecraft is there are so many different things that can go wrong. Trying to keep track of all of them is impossible for one person. It's almost impossible for an entire organization like NASA. You're always trying to work out what safety margins you can push, what's acceptable and what's not. It seems that nobody had really understood the danger of oxygen at high pressure on the ground, even though the laws of physics say it's almost inevitable. So Don was very upset, as I understand it, that NASA management had not caught this in time and that the crew had died. That was a pretty common feeling amongst the astronauts. They were upset that their lives had been put in jeopardy in that way. However, this was tempered by the fact that they were team members, that they wanted to get NASA back on track and get to the moon. Not only did their careers depend on it, but this is something they all put years into working on. They believed in this program and they wanted to get back on track. So while Don may have felt some personal animosity to certain managers, Overall, he was a very good team member at trying to get everybody back on track and trying to get NASA back on track to the moon. Um, moving on to Apollo 7, uh, what was the purpose of Apollo 7 and what did they accomplish during that time? As the decade was coming to a close, NASA had to get going on these missions if they were going to get to the moon by the end of the decade. Apollo 1 was supposed to be the test flight of the Apollo spacecraft. 
almost like any jet plane, it has a first checkout flight or a series of them to make sure everything works before you really put it to the test. It was the same with the Apollo spacecraft. They wanted to send it into Earth orbit, make sure everything worked okay. Only then are they going to commit to another mission to send it out to the moon and really put it to the test. Apollo 1 was supposed to do that. When that crew died, Don Isley's crew, the Apollo 7 crew, got shuffled up. They had been the backups for Apollo 1. Now they were going to literally step into dead men's shoes and take on that job. Because of the fire and all the work that had to be done to re repair the spacecraft, modify the spacecraft, and essentially create a brand new generation of Apollo spacecraft, there was even more work to be done. Plus, they'd lost about a year and a half. We're now in late 1968. They want to land on the moon in 1969. Time is ticking, and so not only have they got to make sure that spacecraft works, they've got to make sure it works to the point where NASA feels comfortable sending the next one to the moon. Uh, why did they want to film up there? What was the purpose of that? Why did they want to film? Uh, in Apollo 7, they made a, a, a web episode. Oh, the TV show. thing, yes, yeah. okay. So not only was this a very important checkout flight of all the engineering stuff, but NASA were always aware that the taxpayers were paying for the space program, and they could just as easily lose interest, at which point NASA may lose funding. It was always important to keep people aware of what was going on. One good way of doing that in the late 60s, that still is, is television. NASA had done some television broadcasts from spacecraft before, but they'd never done a live television show for inside a spacecraft before. So one of the plans, if everything went okay with all the vital engineering tests, was to have an, a television show from space. And that's what they ended up doing. A couple of days into the mission, the television cameras came on. And even though it's a tiny spacecraft, it looks very big with a wide angle lens. And they essentially gave the general public a tour of the spacecraft. Each took turns saying things, had some fun with it, held up little cue cards and joked around with people. It really gave the, the public an impression of what it was like to be in space. And it was such a successful program, they actually ended up winning an Emmy Award for it. Uh, so uh, after the flight, uh, what happened to Don Isley? So how do I, let me, so how do I say this tactfully? That'd be an interesting one. <laughs> The, the crew of Apollo 7, led by Wally Shirao, went into this mission very, very aware that three of their colleagues had died in the spacecraft fire before. They were determined to get this right, and that set a very different tone. It was understandable. NASA had never lost astronauts before in a spacecraft before that. So they went in very, very determined. That also caused a little bit of friction with the ground in that they were saying, essentially, we are in charge up here. You can help us from the ground in mission control. Mission Control had a slightly different philosophy. We are in charge. We're going to send you some commands. Please carry them out. It was a philosophical difference. It's hard to say who's right or wrong. It could have gone better from an office politics point of view. Wally Shura, the commander of the mission, had already decided to retire after the flight. The trouble was this was Don Isley and Walt Cunningham's first mission. So they kind of had that cloud over them a little bit when they came back. And so Don's career was now a little bit in question. I'm going to stop there because of the airplane. I think we cut it off in a good point. Um, so let's continue. After Apollo 7, Don did get other spaceflight assignments. He was assigned to the backup crew for Apollo 10. So if the prime crew had, for some reason, somebody had been ill or something like that, Don could have gone to the moon on Apollo 10. However, it was kind of seen as a placeholder situation. It was a feeling in the office that Don essentially was on his way out and probably wasn't going to fly again. So he did Apollo 10. However, the mood in the office he felt was not really feeling too good. So he decided to go over to NASA Langley, another NASA center away from the human spaceflight program at the time, where they'd never had an astronaut work there before. They welcomed him with open arms. They made him feel very warm, very comfortable. And he did some more work there for a couple of years until finally he was eligible for his Air Force pension and decided to retire from the Air Force and from NASA at that point. Also, that, that reminded me about uh, right when they were coming down, wasn't there thinking about uh, being like all of them got sick and they had to take off their helmets? And, sure. Yeah. So during the Apollo 7 flight, Wally Shirag got a head cold. And if you've ever been in an airplane with a head cold, you know sometimes that confinement, that pressure can make it really miserable. It looks like Don began to get that cold as well. So you've got three guys up there in very confined quarters, two of whom are getting pretty sick. Wally Sharar is feeling very sick, and it wasn't a comfortable situation. It no doubt added to the, the grumpy feeling that some of the mission controllers could hear on the radio. 
When it was time to come down, Wally Shura had an understandable concern. They were asked to put on their spacesuits and also put on their pressurized space helmets. At that point, if they're coming down through the atmosphere and his head cold blocks his ears, he would not be able to reach his hand up like we all do and just blow and equalize the pressure in his ears. He was worried he was going to rupture an eardrum doing that. It's understandable. NASA, however, this is the very first Apollo mission. They want to play it by the book, and they say the rules say you put your helmets on. For the first time, really, in the space program, the commander of the spacecraft said, I actually think I've got the right idea here. I'm actually not going to do what you're advising. I'm going to do this my own way. This conversation went back and forward in the last couple of days of the mission. Wally Shura, in the end, decided not to put his spacecraft helmet on. His crew members followed that. They came down. Everything was fine. And in subsequent missions, like Apollo 11, they came back without space helmets on. It turned out not to be necessary. However, that did cause a little bit of friction, and once again, the crew was seen as being a little bit insubordinate. Don Isley really had no choice. He's sitting next to his commander, literally inches away in a spacecraft in space. What do you do? Say no to your commander? He's a military officer. He knows how to follow rules. He was caught in a very difficult situation in between what the ground were telling him to do, and what his commander was telling him to do. There was no good way out of that. So uh, there is a part uh, where when he came down, he was having, he, he found another lady and he started, uh, he was divorcing his wife. Mm -hmm. Can you go over all of that once um, all the flight crew was, all, all the flying was done? Sure. When the original Mercury astronauts were picked in 1959, and Wally Shirra was one of them, they were more than astronauts. They were seen as icons of American culture. They were all American, apple pie, going off to fight the Soviets in a Cold War. They were seen as embodiments of American culture. And in that way, they were supposed to be almost too good to be true. They were supposed to be clean living, not drinking, family guys. Now, if you've ever met any test pilots, you know test pilots are not that way. They like drinking, they like driving fast cars. The stereotype is almost the opposite. So these astronauts had to play kind of a careful game throughout the 1960s of appearing for the media to be very clean cut, while whatever they were actually doing in their life had to be very, very quiet. And they weren't all partiers, but a good number of them were. NASA's opinion on that tended to be, if this gets in the media, you are probably finished as a career. But whatever you're doing in your private time, as long as we don't know about it, and particularly as long as the American public don't know about it, okay, we'll turn a blind eye. There was an example in 1965 of a scientist astronaut called Dwayne Grevelin, who had just been selected for NASA. His wife threatened him with divorce. Didn't even divorce him, threatened him with divorce, and they told him, leave. You re resign. They told him to resign, essentially, and he never even made the official group photo. He was out within weeks. So the precedent was, keep your marriage together if you're an astronaut, now, however bad it is. A number of astronauts kept very shaky marriages together for a number of years for the sake of their careers. Don was coming to the end of his first marriage. He'd met somebody he'd fallen in love with. He ended up marrying her, and they spent the rest of his life together. It was a, a love match. Unfortunately, this was very unfortunate timing. This was right around the time of his mission. He was told, as was kind of policy, keep this quiet until after the flight. Please don't make any waves. And that's what happened during the flight. However, after the mission, I think he was the first guy who was really about to have a public divorce. And as such was, again, a little bit of a test case. And NASA said, never officially, but it was pretty clear he was not going to fly again. So he was given a backup position on Apollo 10, but it was clear that was probably never going to translate to another actual space flight. What were his uh, new wife's thoughts on it? I remember in the book you uh, met with her and she wrote a little bit about it and she had a lot to say. I thought it was very sure. interesting. It's hard to imagine what it's like to come into a culture like NASA's when there are so many public pressures, institutional pressures, the president can have opinions, certainly Congress can have opinions on your own marriage. That's a huge hothouse kind of situation that most of us as private individuals never have to deal with. Susie Isley, her only crime was falling in love with Don Isley, who was a NASA astronaut. And all of a sudden, she's got this incredible amount of pressure on her. When she gets married to him, the other astronaut wives, many of whom were holding together marriages just for the sake of their husband's career, saw her as an enormous threat. 
what happens if this guy can divorce and remarry and still fly? That means they could go through a divorce and be cast out and their husband's careers would continue. She was seen as a threat to the order of NASA families and so as such was shunned by the other wives. Some of them were very nice to her. Some of them continued to be her friends for the rest of her life. But a couple of them said sort of high schoolish things such as if she's at that party, I'm going to walk out very, very dramatically. And Susie was a very realistic person. She's like, I don't have time to deal with this nonsense. What is this? I've just fallen in love with this guy. What is this nonsense? Very difficult for her. Don could see that too. And it was pretty clear that they needed to get out of Houston if they were going to have any kind of happy life. So Don was able to get a transfer to NASA Langley. This was away from all the Houston office politics and petty personal politics. They loved him up there. They made lifelong friends. They had a great time and he finished out his NASA career as part of a very happy marriage. And it was clear it was a love match for the next couple of decades. They were together right up until Don's passed away. This was obviously the marriage for him. Before he uh, passed away and right after he retired, uh, he was still focused on space. He didn't give up on space flight and educating others. And uh, if you talk about that, you know, he flew to Thailand for a little bit and then he was going to Japan to make a deal with um, about the space camp that they were doing over there. Sure. Like a lot of people who were NASA astronauts, they were actually military people as well, and they didn't actually give up their military careers. They were assigned to NASA, but remained with their military organization, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, whoever it was. Don was an Air Force officer. He was assigned to NASA by the Air Force. To get his pension, he had to be in the Air Force for a number of years. So even when he was beginning to wind down his NASA career, he wanted to stay in the Air Force long enough to get his Air Force pension. He was just a couple of years away from getting a full Air Force pension. That made absolute sense. He got assigned to the Peace Corps out in Thailand. He did some great work for the Peace Corps out there until he was able to fully retire. What happened with a lot of Apollo astronauts, almost all of them, is that they wanted to kind of shake the space program out of their hair once they were done. They had become celebrities in some ways, but they also had other careers, and they didn't just want to be defined by one thing. The sad thing is that often happens with people. Buzz Aldrin will forever be remembered as one of the two guys who landed on the moon first. No matter what else he does in the rest of his life, a couple of hours will be how we define him. Some of those guys, that kind of annoyed them a bit. Like, I'm a talented guy. I, I want to do other things. I want to continue. So Don started getting into the business world. Apart from a couple of get-togethers, he really didn't have much interaction with NASA at all, or certainly his former astronauts, friends. So he went on and did other things. He had a career in business. But once again, as seemed to happen with all of these guys, after about 10 or years or so, they're like, wait a second, I was actually part of the humankind's greatest engineering achievement ever. Maybe I should not be quite so dismissive of that for a while. So by the early 80s, a lot of these guys begin to wind up getting back into talking about space a lot more. Then they start to do a lot more public appearances or their careers begin to go that way. Such as the case with Don. Don had been working with a Japanese steel company and it turned out they wanted to open an equivalent of space camp out in Japan. And having an astronaut they were working with all the time, it was a natural for Don to begin to get involved with that. So they began to get him involved in some of those meetings and he ended up planning on going out to Japan and actually being a part of the opening of this space camp place. What was the overall reaction when he passed away over there? We are down to about half of the Apollo moonwalkers still being alive. And this is a long time after Don Isley passed away. Most of these guys have made it into their mid eighties with no problem. A lot of them because they were in great physical shape to be selected as astronauts. So it was a great surprise when a couple of these guys passed away very early and Don very sadly was one of the earliest guys from the Apollo program to pass away. It was a surprise to everybody. Certainly he had not exhibited any real signs of ill health. He had gone over to Japan to help open this Japanese space camp, so obviously had not felt too unwell to travel. He was over there, he'd gone out jogging that morning, feeling in great shape, gone back to his hotel room, as I understand it, and passed away in his hotel room of a heart attack. Very, very young. His wife and his kids were in another country, and all of a sudden get a phone call he's passed away in Japan. And Susie, his wife's first thought, of course, is how on earth do I get Don's body back from Japan? A horrible situation to be left in and a great shock for everybody. 
Susie was lucky in that she had some help from some of Don's business colleagues who were able to arrange for some private arrangements and bring him back. And he's now in Arlington Cemetery, just outside of DC. But an incredible shock. Nobody ex ever expects to lose a husband or a father that early in life. Do you need to reset? Or are you? Yeah, that camera died. Oh, OK. Oh, the, their let's, camera cut. You, all right, let's take a short break. Mm -hmm. Why you it didn't die? It just no, no, it, it cut. It can only do 20 minutes at a time. Mm. Oh, okay, okay. I forgot to tell you that before I press record, but then I couldn't find a good window to say it. Are we okay for that last one? You got what yeah, you needed or something? Okay, great. So if you had to summarize, uh, or when you think of Don Isley, and you, uh, what story do you think of? Like what, what is his legacy? Why is he important? When I think of Don Isley, I, it was somebody I wanted to know about because most astronauts of the shuttle era couldn't even pronounce his name correctly. He's somebody who was in the middle of a couple of huge NASA events and yet became almost forgotten right away. So I was very curious as to who this guy was. He was apparently a very easygoing, goofy, jokey, mild-mannered guy who didn't like to make waves and yet somehow was involved in two of NASA's most contentious things at that time. One was the issue of astronaut divorce which shook NASA in the late 60s and early 70s very, very much. And the other was the Apollo 7 flight, which under Wally Shiraz's command was quite contentious with, a, with some disagreements between the ground and the astronauts in the spacecraft. So for this very, very easygoing guy to be involved in these two sort of ground shaking events was, was really quite surprising. How having said that, with the time and legacy and a couple of decades to look at it, I think Apollo 7 is unjustly forgotten as the most important mission of that time. NASA had lost the Apollo 1 crew on the ground. They needed to get back into space and have a successful mission. If that hadn't happened, America may not have landed on the moon in the 1960s. Had they missed Kennedy's deadline, maybe Congress would have canceled the moon program. We may have landed on the moon decades later. So that Apollo 7 flight had to go absolutely correctly. And Don Isley was a key guy in making sure that spacecraft worked correctly. Um, they also... Uh can you, can you go over his nickname for what's his name? I, I know that sure. he had a mug even with all of that, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Every NASA astronaut, after they pass away, gets a memorial tree planted at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And when Don Isley's turn came, the head of the NASA astronaut office came out, planted a tree and said, and this is for Don Easel. And the Vice President of America at the time, Hubert Humphrey in the, in the 60s at the time of the Apollo 7 flight, also stumbled over pronouncing Don's name. Nobody could get his last name correct. So on the morning of launch, it was traditional to have a morning breakfast, of a, a, so with the astronauts all sitting around the table, talking with their backup crew before they put their spacesuits on and went out to the pad. If you look very carefully at those NASA photos, you can see there's a mug in front of Don with what's his name written on it because it was that much of a formal joke at that point that nobody could pronounce this guy's name. And the, group, the, the, uh, and the crew became known as Wally Walt and what's his name because that was a, an easy way of, of talking about this crew too. So one of these guys who managed to sort of breeze through NASA history so much that nobody could even still to this day pronounce his name easily. And yet he is one of the most important astronauts in my point of view. After, after the space flight, uh, they weren't very recognized for a while because of all the other uh, space flights overshadowing them. Mm -hmm. um, until later on, they uh, started giving awards, but way later after it was all over. Um, do you know how maybe other astronauts felt or how Don felt about that sort of situation? Sure. Apollo 7, by being an enormous success, almost sowed the seeds for itself to be forgotten. Because Apollo 7 was so successful, NASA took a very, very bold step. Even though the Apollo 1 crew had died, and even though they'd only had one successful mission, Apollo 7 in Earth orbit, they decided Apollo 7 was so successful, the next mission we're going to send into orbit around the moon. Humans had never been to the moon. The next Apollo mission was not supposed to go to the moon. It was supposed to be another Earth orbital test. 
But Apollo 7 was so good, they said, let's go to the moon. And the trouble is, once people start going to the moon, the general public and the historians start forgetting about those missions that only went into Earth orbit. Something that's incredible, going into Earth orbit, now becomes only going into Earth orbit. So Apollo 7 got forgotten as Apollo 8 went to the moon, Apollo 10 went to the moon, and finally Apollo 11 landed on the moon, all within a very short period of time after Apollo 7. Kind of human nature for that to happen. In, we'll wait for that plane. And now, decades later, we can look at these missions with a little bit more of a wider overview, and we see how important Apollo 7 is. I talked to Walt Cunningham a lot about Apollo 7, and he says, I was kind of forgotten for a long time. Now, when I go to events, I'm an Apollo astronaut, and people don't remember which ones landed on the moon, which ones didn't. I'm celebrated as much as the moonwalkers. And it's true. And now Apollo is seen as a whole program, and all of those missions and all of those people are justly seen as important. So Apollo 7 has now begun to rise a little bit more in the consciousness of historians as something that, without that, none of the other ones would have happened. Um, last question. Uh, so for, what, what do you think about our current space age and um, what do you see, or what do you foresee in the future? So Don Isley was alive until the mid to late 80s. And in that time, he witnessed the Challenger accident through the media, and he was very upset about that. He was looking at what happened with Apollo 1 and almost seeing it as a repeat. And that's something that's important to remember in general in space history, which is with a new generation of managers and engineers coming in, sometimes lessons get forgotten. We're looking at what's happening now, with America still building its own capability to get back to the space station, in the meantime relying on the Russians. It's a difficult situation. It's hard to imagine that we're, we're going so many years without an American human spaceflight. We have people on the space station, an incredible engineering achievement. The trouble is when people are living up there for years and years, it's not as dramatic as landing on the moon, so people don't pay as much attention. But we're probably doing more amazing stuff in space now than we've ever done before. It's just become part of everyday life. What happens next is very important because it's dependent on the general public, it's dependent on Congress, on our funding. And there's no real huge thing like man, moon, decade that JFK said. Everybody could get that. We're gonna land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. There's a goal, we'll do it. The trouble is when you finish that goal, what do you do next? And we've been in that what do you do next thing ever since the days of Apollo 7. So what we do next is pretty important, and right now we're gradually doing some very important things, but there's no huge overarching goal like there was in the time of Apollo. Uh, for what, what do you think about us trying to land on Mars and looking for exoplanets that we can get to, or habitable planets? So we're in a very interesting time right now where we are sending rovers all over Mars, we're sending robotic spacecraft to the fringes of our solar system, and we're getting better and better with telescopes where we're finding many, many other stars have planets around them, some of them which seem to have the same conditions as we understand life to be possible. So it's a very, very exciting time where we're getting a lot of information. The question is, where do we send people next? Right now, people have been living in space since the beginning of the century, continually. Not the same people, but crews. There's always been somebody in space on that space station. And that's an exciting thing to learn what happens to humans for years and years in space. Because if we're going to go anywhere significant, people are going to have to spend many months, maybe even years, traveling through space. What we do next with that is, is interesting because as every president comes in, they change their minds. Some say the moon, some say Mars, then it goes back to the moon, then it goes back to Mars. And NASA has to keep up with whatever the politicians are telling it to do. It's frustrating. If we had a goal, we could have been on Mars by now for decades. It's a good thing we're learning the best ways of doing it. I hope that and eventually there's some kind of actual plan that we stick to and we do. But it's a very exciting time right now. We're looking at all these different images coming down from the robots all around the solar system and going, my goodness, every day there's something incredible. Thank <laughs> you.
I'd love to show you inside this. Um, I'd love to show you the space suit around the corner because that definitely ties in with what we've been talking about. Yeah, we'll just walk around now yeah. and you can talk about okay. So I can like, I'd love to point to the, the two telescope things at the back there if that's gonna work for your shot. So back here, there's two, you kind of got to crouch down and see them, but there's two, like, there's two optical things back there. So, so I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Um, so whenever you want me to do that. These things in the back here? Yeah, those two, look, like, two telescope looking things or camera lens looking things. Do you want me to just start talking about it or? Uh, yeah. Okay. So looking inside this very, very small looking Apollo spacecraft, you've got to remember that this was actually in zero gravity. So people could float around all over the place. They could float under the couches. They could float up into the docking tunnel. There was a comparatively large amount of space in this spacecraft for three people to live and work for a good part of a week. The thing that Don is really a huge part of his um, work was to look through these two little telescope mounts at the back of the spacecraft. He was in charge of making sure that this spacecraft knew where it was and where it was going. To do that, he had to optically align with different stars. It was kind of like the same thing that the ancient mariners had used when they're traveling across the oceans, people like Magellan. You find a star, you work out how close it is to the horizon, and they, therefore you can work out where you are. By using a very primitive computer and looking through those optics, Don was able to train the computer to know exactly where they were in space, how fast they were going, and what direction they were going. This was the first time an Apollo spacecraft had ever flown with people inside it. So he was learning as he was going, and he was finding there were some things wrong with the way that Mission Control had written the instructions. The stars were, he was supposed to be able to see stars that were actually going beyond the horizon, and he'd have to look through the Earth to see them. It was impossible. And the computer crashed. He was able to bring it back up. So he actually did a huge amount of work making sure that Apollo could navigate. When the next mission went all the way out to the moon, that was vital to their survival. So what Don learned on this mission using that optical computer was very, very important for the entire rest of the Apollo program. So that's kind of, I just want to make sure, because that's a really nice example of it, you know. So we could also talk about, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine three people all wearing spacesuits. So you're literally crammed shoulder to shoulder, sitting in these couches, launching into space. But these are guys who were, jet pilots. They were used to being in very tiny cockpits for hours at a time, flying often solo. So this was not a big deal to them. In fact, compared to prior spacecraft such as Mercury and Gemini, this felt comparatively roomy. Once you get into space, you can actually fold these couches away. They could take their spacesuits off and they could float around the spacecraft as best they could. Now, you, you hear about things like going to the bathroom in space. It's hard to imagine any kind of privacy, but actually if you float under the couches down to the bottom of the spacecraft, there is a comparative amount of privacy where the guy, at least you're not, other people are not looking at you while you're going to the bathroom. So it was possible to do that. Another problem they had on Apollo 7 is they had this idea that somebody had to be awake all the time to listen to mission control. This was the last time they did that in space because it was a stupid idea. The rest, of the, the rest of the crews for Apollo all slept at the same time. But this one, they wanted somebody awake. So they had Wally Shira and Walt Cunningham awake on one shift, and they had Don Isley awake on a different shift. So Don was supposed to be sleeping inches away from these other two guys while they carried out their entire work day. And then he was supposed to stay awake and work while they were silent and asleep. It was impossible. Everybody was kind of awake all the time. It no doubt contributed to why people got a little bit grumpy on this flight because nobody was getting a good night's sleep. So they never did that again. But Don did get some very, very private moments where the other two were trying to sleep to just look out of these windows and watch the earth go by and enjoy it as an individual, enjoy it solo and really enjoy doing that. And I watched some of the footage and it looked like it looked much more spacious in the footage than it does just oh, sure. from here. Yeah. When you watch the 16 millimeter footage they shot, and when you, particularly the television footage, a lot of it is taken with extreme wide angle lenses, and it makes this spacecraft look huge. But when you actually compare that to the inside of spacecraft such as this, you realize there's not that much room at all. Essentially, one person could stretch out and almost touch all four walls at once. It's a very, very small area, but on television, it looks a lot bigger because if they'd actually used a normal lens, you'd just be seeing tiny little bits of it. So I could talk about the spacesuits. I could talk about the hatch around here too, because that definitely ties in with Apollo 1 and the... Let's see what we got. 
So again, just let me know when you're, you're ready. So I'm just going to talk about this thing here. You good? Okay. So here we have an Apollo spacecraft hatch, and this was a vital part of what Apollo 7 had to test. On Apollo 1, it had been this hatch that had actually contributed to killing the Apollo 1 crew. It was designed never to open in space, which was very, very important to make sure the crew were stay alive in the pressurized spacecraft. The problem was it took a long time to open because of that. So when there was a fire inside the spacecraft, they could not get the hatch open in time, and they died. By the time of Apollo 7 design, spacecraft hatches like this, it was a lot easier. There was a quick open lever. They could open this and get out in seconds if needed. But it also was totally pressured so that when they were in space, it wasn't going to open and cause a fatal accident. So a remarkable piece of engineering that made sure that Don Isley and that crew stayed alive on the Apollo 7 mission. So that's the hatch. And then we've got the spacesuit over there. You said that this was the... Oh yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the rocket. Hey, David. So again, let me know when you're, you're ready. Okay. So when the Apollo spacecraft went to the moon, they needed the enormous Saturn V rocket, which was 363 feet high, which is the, the height of the Statue of Liberty. To send something like Apollo 7 just into Earth orbit wasn't going to go all the way to the moon. They could use a slightly smaller version of that rocket, the Saturn 1B. So this is the rocket that launched Apollo 7. You can see the, the spacecraft at the top there is that little white triangular shaped part. So three people will be inside that. The silvery part is the service module, which would have all the oxygen and all the other supplies they would need. That's the part that blew up on the Apollo 13 crew. So that's the part that almost killed them. It worked very well on Apollo 7. And then the rest of this is all just fuel just to get into Earth orbit. It takes a lot to launch something that big. It doesn't look that big compared to the rest of the rocket, but it really is. It's very, very heavy spacecraft. So it needs all that just to get into space. All of this stuff got thrown away afterwards. This, this burned up. And the, the only part that came back to Earth was that tiny little triangle at the top. And even that was never used again. It ends up in a museum. So you can see why after Apollo, NASA went to a space shuttle and a reusable system, because you can see just how much is only ever used once and thrown away on this one. Yeah, so imagine, you know, October 1968, Don Isley and the other two are sitting on top of this. No, no human has ever sat on top of one of these and launched before. The only people who were about to were the Apollo 1 crew, and they died. They died on the same launch pad that Apollo 7 is about to launch from. So you, these three astronauts are sitting literally where three other people have died, and they are hoping that their day is going to be very different. When that rocket launches, something's going to happen. It could be a good day, it could be a bad day, but it's going to be an interesting day. Fortunately, this was a flawless launch. They got into space absolutely fine, and the mission went well. But that's got to be a very nerve-wracking moment, that first time you're sitting in an untried spacecraft on an untried rocket for the very, very first time. That's scary. How do you think, like, some... How, how does somebody do that after knowing, like, their friends just died doing this exact thing, and they're like, okay, I'm next, I'm going to do it? So sitting on a launch pad knowing that the, the last three people who got close to this died has got to be a very interesting thought. The thing about test pilots, and both Don Isley and Wally Sherrard had been test pilots, and Walt Cunningham had also been a jet pilot, is you kind of get used to death, as I understand it. In the test piloting community, people die all the time because they are testing airplanes to the very limits. Sometimes those limits are fatal. So you have to come up with a kind of a mindset of, that may have happened to them, but it wouldn't happen to me. Something they, it was an unlucky day for them, or I would have noticed something that they didn't. You have to have a somewhat fatalistic viewpoint where things like that happen to other people, but it's not going to bother me. So my assumption is these three guys sitting on top of this had very much the same kind of mindset, which is, I've done everything I can. I know I'm ready to do everything I can. If there's something wrong with this rocket, there's nothing I can do. As I understand it, the primary thought in these guys' mind is, if something goes wrong, do not let it be my fault. I'm going to do everything I can. And if this mission is a failure, please, please, please don't let it be something I did. So that's what they were focused on, doing their jobs to the best of their abilities. Welcome. So yeah, I think it's probably like one last major thing. And that would be the, the space suit. Although we got, we got the optics on the back here, that might be kind of fun.
Um, so I guess from around here, I might be able to point out these bits on the top. So looking at the back of an Apollo spacecraft, you can see there are two circular parts. So that's where the optical system comes out. So there had to be literally a hole in the top of the spacecraft to allow Don Isley to look through those optics and find stars. One of them is a, a big wide view optical telescope and one is a narrow view. So he'd look at a section of stars and work out where he was in the sky. Then using the narrow one, he'd work out individual stars and he'd tell the computer, I'm looking at this star. So by using that system, he was able to navigate this entire Apollo spacecraft through space. There were other ways of doing it. They could talk on the radio and work out where they were with mission control. They were being tracked by radar from the ground. That gave them certain information. But these guys are pilots. They are, you know, they are very um, proud of what they can do individually. So if the radio had failed, they would still know exactly where they were in space and able to navigate their way back to Earth as much as they could just by sighting on stars. So Don testing that system was a really, really important part of Apollo 7. In the memoir, he talked a lot about it. Like he was, it sounded like he was very proud of doing it. And he kind of like turned it into a game where he was like, all right, I got to position this. So I thought it was really interesting. I didn't know that's how it looked like, though. He always talked about a sextant too. That's, yeah, that's it. That's the one. Cool. So here we've got a spacesuit. This would be a, a good thing. Yeah, I'm not sure what your glare is going to be on this, but. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's go to the Just turn it off. We good? Are we? Okay. So this is an Apollo space suit. This one was actually designed for Apollo 8. However, Apollo 7 space suits were virtually identical. And you can see how much of a space suit Don and the other crew would have to have worn inside that tiny spacecraft for Apollo 7. This was basically to save their lives had anything depressurized in the spacecraft, if the hatch had failed or something else. It was also supposed to be worn at moments of greater danger in the mission, such as re-entry. The Apollo 7 crew chose not to wear the helmets on re-entry, and so essentially the spacesuit was a nice outfit at that point. But you can see what it has to do. Now imagine when this is pressurized, the trouble with pressurizing anything is it becomes like a balloon, it expands, and nobody can do any useful work if they're essentially a balloon shape. So this had to have all kinds of special levers and parts inside where the arms could move and lock, and so you wouldn't have to be constantly fighting the pressure of the suit. So an incredibly technical, amazing object here. It's a, basically a little mini spacecraft in itself. It has all the conditions that you need to survive on Earth, the pressure, the oxygen, the temperature. Without even having a spacecraft around you, you could essentially survive in space wearing one of these. Is that, uh, is that how the helmets used to look like? Yeah. They look like they're just fish bowls. Very much so, yeah. What we have today. So this is one of the space suit helmets that would be virtually identical to what the Apollo 7 astronauts wore. You can see that there's no way to just reach up and clear your ears if you were wearing one of these. So Wally Shura decided that he and his crew were not going to wear these on re-entry because they were worried about their eardrums bursting with head colds. And so these helmets stayed off. The neck ring on the space suit is actually designed to cushion the, the neck with the helmet on. So they had to improvise. They were actually tying up trash and food bags and other things to cushion their necks so that if they landed very hard on the ocean, they wouldn't hurt themselves. And that was what Mission Control were most worried about. They were very, very worried they were going to come down for a hard landing. As it was, they, they plopped down in the ocean pretty mildly to the point they could hardly feel it. And it, it was a, a moot issue. Awesome. Anything else? Uh, we've got a piece of Apollo 7, sometimes on display. Do we have it now? Where is it? No, we don't. I don't think we do. No, unfortunately we don't. We've got moon rocks, which are cool. We can talk about moon rocks if you want to, you know. So that would be right here. So again, let me know when we're ready. We did have an, a strut from Apollo 7 in that one, but we don't have it right now, I guess. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. So here's in many ways the whole point of what Apollo 7 was aiming for, which is by the time of Apollo 11, moon rocks were coming back to Earth. 
without Apollo 7, these missions would not have been possible. And we've got some moon rocks here from Apollo 11, from Apollo 15, and from Apollo 17. And it's kind of hard for me to get my head around this, but you know, there's a human being was standing on the moon, they got their gloved hand or another instrument, they picked up these pieces of rock, put them in a bag, it went back into a spacecraft and was brought all the way back to Earth, and now here they are in front of us. So just an incredible mind journey, if nothing else, that these are actual pieces from the surface of the moon that people picked up. That started happening in 1969 would not have been possible without Apollo 7 in late 1968. So it was a vital mission to make sure that the success of those Apollo lunar landing missions actually happened. They're kind of cool, aren't they? I mean, it just really is like, there it is. Those are crystals on it too, right? So, well, it's hard to tell because they're encased in plastic and sometimes little air bubbles get in, but it's, um, it's kind of like a volcanic rock, like the kind of stuff you're seeing coming out of Hawaii right now, bubbling across the streets and stuff. It's pretty much that similar stuff. And without any weathering, it kind of looks like it does fresh on Hawaii right now. You know, it, doesn't, it never really changes. Didn't they also have orange rock on them? Yeah, on Apollo 17, they found some orange soil. They the actually, last, the very last one. Yeah, because it was somewhere they think it was like the last gasp of a volcanic event that kind of oh. shut up some last stuff before it stopped. So they found that. Yeah, they found all kinds of evidence of different volcanic rocks. So then we found it on their last one. And that orange soil, like, yeah, the okay, very last one. Done. Pretty much. Well, they had a geologist on that mission, which they never had on any other mission too. So I would hope the other missions would have spotted something like that. But having a geologist along certainly really helped because yeah. he knew exactly what to look for. So, yeah. Nice. So that's everything I can think of. Um, you know, you've got this Apollo 9 spacecraft, which is very much like Apollo 7. So you can, you could, you know, there's where the parachutes come out. You've got the heat shield and all the, you know, you could get a light on the heat shield and really yeah, well. see the, that kind of stuff. And, uh, so I, I saw there was staff beginning to show up. So your sound thing is you're going to get less good sound from now on. But, That's right. but okay. if you're getting B-roll, then it doesn't matter, you know, yeah, that exactly. way. So you can shoot around as much as you like. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Um, do, do you want to, how are the walking shots? I think the walking shots actually look pretty good. Do you mm -hmm. want to do a run through of just like, can we, can we uh, get okay, shots? Cut. I'm going to yeah, cut right now too. Okay. Um, can we get shots? Let me cut this because we don't need to talk to you. Um, of you just walking and looking sure, at the absolutely. See if that's part of the people. Uh, yeah, so you want to go around the back where it's kind of... So the, the stuff when he came around here, that all looked really good. Um, why don't we grab some B-roll of the stuff we've already talked about? It's like the moon rock, the space suit, just kind of stationary, get good lighting on it before more people start coming through. What, oh, okay, so you think we're done with the run through? We don't need it? No, I think we should we should get that. But he was saying that he said more people are going to start. Yeah, more people in. are going to begin to come in and start setting up for opening. So the time to get like the um, dedicated yeah, yeah. people yeah. that we can. All right, uh, let's do that. Then. So it just like five minutes, and then we can do. It. I don't know if you need to turn this off right now. Oh, or yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah, no, that was more than I needed. Now, now I'm thinking that I could expand this.